Praise God, hallelujah. Amen. You're a good looking group. Everybody happy, healthy? Wealthy and wise. Wealthy and wise. Amen. You stole that from Gary Dalton, didn't you? <laughs> You're such a good looking group. Uh, I just share this with you. I started away to Sunday morning, but it is so neat. You know, Jerry Savelle said that 2022, 2022 would be the year of the open hand. You know, God's hand is open to give full provision. And he said, uh, expect unusual, extraordinary, supernatural provision. Well, we're taking this money for Daniel, you know, and, and taking that money in, I thought, well, you know, we're just, we're just one, one group. I mean, you know, he was part of us very strongly, but one group. But, but the, the, the money came in really fast, <laughs> you know. And Margaret said, you know, said something to me afterwards. I said, well, you got to understand, one person gave us $6,000, so the money came in fast. That's somebody outside the church. That's unusual, extraordinary, and supernatural provision, isn't it? Yeah. Outside the church. <laughs> yeah. And so it's interesting that there was a, I got a, uh, I got a call, somebody telling me and said, you know, right when you first did that, which was just a couple of weeks before that, because like I said, it came in so fast. So I said, the Lord spoke to me and said, I want to, I want you to give money to help Daniel for his coming back home. You know, we've talked about, you know, he needs money when he comes back home, hadn't been working all that. And so it's interesting that they heard from the Lord so strong about that. And then that money came in so quickly. So they left a, a pretty significant check on my desk. Amen. And so that's just from Sunday, this Sunday to now. So we have $925 more to send Daniel. Amen. Amen. And then I, I, I checked the mail before I, I got here. And this is, this is kind of unusual, extraordinary supernatural provision because this is a check from somebody that went home to be with the Lord about six months ago. Their family, you know, sent it to me, sent it to, to the church, $4,000. Wow. Well, that's unusual, supernatural, extraordinary, supernatural provision, isn't it? Glory. How many of you believe it's the year of the open hand for you? <laughs> Enclosed as a gift for CCF to in honor of my dad. Listen to this, so powerful. I received some monies after dad's passing. I did his funeral and felt impressed to give it, to give in honor of him. He taught me to tithe through example. And, and I know the family pretty good. And, and this man came to church later in life. But when he was younger, he didn't necessarily go to church that much or hardly at all. But he supported his wife and his, you know, family going. So, so just keep that in mind. He said, he taught me to tithe through example. As I was growing up, he would place a check on the table to take to church on Sunday. See, because he wasn't going. He was my first example of generosity. Although his latter years proved to be difficult in some ways physically, and not, not terribly, but, you know, he had some problems. And, of course, in the end, before he passed away, I'm saying that. But he said, but not financially. He was always provided for. He always provided for. God always provided for him financially exactly what he needed. Glory to God. Amen. Amen. As a matter of fact, it troubled him his last few years because he, you know, he couldn't get out and he couldn't go. He was actually stayed at a home. And uh, he would share how he wanted to tithe. I still believe that God honored the years and seeds he had sown by providing for him in those latter years. Isn't that a wonderful testimony? Amen. Year of the open hand of unusual, extraordinary, supernatural provision. Hallelujah. hallelujah. I said hallelujah. hallelujah. Amen. Are you ready for the Word of God? Yes. Let's look at Acts chapter 2. Yes. Acts chapter 2. Acts 2, 42. Or we'll back up and read verse 41. Acts 2, 41. And those who gladly received his word were baptized, and that day about 3,000 souls were added to them, that is, to the church. And they, the believers, continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, in the breaking of bread, and in prayers. The Amplified says they were continually and faithfully devoting themselves to the instruction of the apostles, and to fellowship, and eating meals together, and to prayers. The contemporary English version says they were like family to one another or to each other. And then the voice translation says they continually committed themselves to gathering. Then it gives those reasons. But one of those reasons was they continually committed themselves to gathering, 
for fellowship, for fellowship. Sunday morning, we started a message that I was entitled, Why Church? You know, Why Church? Or in, in more uh, accurately, I guess, why go to church? Why do you go to church? And we said that most Christians only think in terms of how going to church will bless them and help them in some way. And certainly, certainly there are enormous benefits, enormous advantages and blessings uh, that come to those who attend church, attend church regularly, I should say. Amen. But we said that the first reason, the first reason, not the only reason, but the first reason we ought to come to church is to give something. We ought to bring something with us to give, not just to get something. And when we give, then we what? Receive. Amen. Jesus said it's more blessed to give than to receive. So as we do our part and bring our part and come to church, amen, to give worship to God, to do things that help build His kingdom and His plan and His purposes, and to take our place, glory to God, and bring our particular anointing, our particular supply, our particular gifting and talents to bless others and serve others, then we receive tremendous blessings in return. Can you say amen? And as always, as always, as always, we must do things the right way with right motives in order to get the right results. How many of you want to get the right results? I mean, you don't want to get wrong results, do you? <laughs> you want to get right results. Now, let me define right results. To me, right results is, is first of all, results that please God, results that are God-honoring. Results that, that magnify God and that please God. So I want, I, want to, I want to get the right results. Glory to God. I want what I do to please God. Amen. And, uh, and, to, and uh, bring honor to God. And then, you know, my results work. In other words, they produce something. They're effective. You're not getting godly results. You're not getting the right results if it's not productive, if it's not fruitful. And you're not getting godly results if it doesn't bring victory and success and blessings to your life. So we want to get right results. Amen. But you cannot, the reason I'm emphasizing this is because this is not, not only important in this one area, but it's important in every single area of our life. So, so that's why I'm talking about that a lot, you know, you know a little bit Sunday morning and tonight. You, you gotta, you have to, first of all, you have to think right. You will not believe right unless you first think right. So when you, when you think right, amen, to get right results, you cannot get right results. Let me back up and say it another way. We won't get right results unless we believe right, unless we act right. And you won't act right unless you believe right. And you won't believe right unless you think right. It all starts with your thinking. You've got to think right. If you think right, you'll believe right. If you believe right, you'll act right and you'll talk right. And if you act right and talk right, then you'll get the right results. And so that's true in this one particular area. We have to think right about church and about why God created the church and why we should come to church. Glory to God. And like I said, this, this is important in every single area of life. You know, I heard just this morning, I heard that, that you know, kids today, children, no, they're not children, a lot of them are adults, but people zero to 29, amen, that only 4% of those have a biblical worldview. According to Barnard Research, only 4% have a biblical worldview. Well, your worldview is what you think about things. And so, you, so only 4% have a biblical worldview view about what they think about religion, about morals, about sex, about politics, about marriage, about social issues, about everything in life. See, in other words, in other words, what they think about the, all these issues, 96% of the people 0 to 29, what they think about these issues is not Bible-based. But if you think wrong and believe wrong and act wrong, you're going to get wrong results. And we want to get right results. Amen? Amen. Glory to God. So we need to, and, and by the way, we're changing that. Amen. We're changing that. The church of the Lord Jesus Christ and through our prayers and through the teaching and preaching of the word and all, you know, the 29 people going to youth camp, we're changing that. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Amen. Because we want people to think right and get right results, godly results. Amen. So, well, then what are we to bring when we come to church? We said, you know, review, we said we bring our prayers and our ability to pray. Glory to God. And then we saw several passages that, 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 that tell us that each one of us is a member or a part of the body of Christ and that we all have something to bring that's important and needed and special. Amen. The body of Christ, the church, is likened to a physical body. 
Well, my physical body is made up of many different parts, many different individual members. And each part brings something special to the table. I'm glad all my parts came with me tonight. If the soles of my feet had decided not to come tonight, I could have got here, but it would have been a struggle. I'm glad all my parts came. Each part and member is connected to and dependent on the other parts. Some people think they're not dependent on other parts of the body of Christ, but according to the Word of God, we are. Amen. And each part is necessary. Each part is valuable. Each part is important. Each part in the body has a special purpose and function. So everyone we saw from these several passages of scriptures has gifts, different gifts, or talents, or abilities. The Holy Spirit has anointed, has graced each person with certain gifts to contribute to the overall health and growth of the body of Christ or boil it down to some particular local church. And your part, my part, when shared, helps make some local church Productive and fruitful and doing God's work. It helps make it a strong, local, and thriving organization. Amen. Your, your part helps the church collectively, and it helps its individual members. Your part, what you bring to the table. Some sing, some preach, some teach, some serve, some administrate, some give. All these different things. Lord, some encourage, all these different things. It, calls, it helps people to be blessed and helped and encouraged and comforted and taught and strengthened and healed and delivered and matured and restored if, if and when necessary. Oh, can you say amen? amen? So powerful, so powerful. So we all bring our anointed supply of the Spirit when we come to church. And it really, really is impossible to measure just how important each person's part is. It really is. It really is. I mean, you know, uh, somebody says you want to give up your, your right hand or your left foot. Well, neither. You know, a chopped off piece of our physical body doesn't contribute to the body. And it doesn't do anything. And if it's chopped off and it's over there, it's not doing anything. Well, you know, the Bible's the one, God's the one that made the comparisons between the human body and the body of Christ. Glory to God. Amen. Amen. And then we are to bring our, we, we just mentioned this one Sunday morning. We'll get into it a little better tonight. We are to bring our, our, our fellowship. Amen. Our fellowship. Christian fellowship is not just friendly communication. It's, 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 it's loving one another. It's, it's checking up on one another. It's encouraging one another. It's bearing one another's burdens. It's praying for one another. It's meeting one another's needs. It's sharing with one another. You know, you come to church and you're out there in the hallways and you're out there, you know, at the men's fellowship, you know, part of the church function, you know, and, 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 and you're sharing scriptures with somebody, and, but they're sharing scriptures back with you and iron sharpens irons and you're giving a testimony and they're giving a testimony. You see somebody in need and then you go whisper to your husband and he comes back and you put money in there. All these kind of things, I, this kind of stuff goes on all the time. <laughs> Just during the fellowship part. The communion part. Glory to God. We, we stir one another up. Hallelujah. Amen. Uh, and, 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 and all of these things, whether, whether it's bring our prayers, we bring our particular anointing, our particular supply of the Spirit, we bring our, ourselves to fellowship with other people, we're going to talk about bringing our faith. All of these things are all interconnected and all work together. You understand that. In other words, while people are fellowshipping, all of a sudden their particular gift is just liable to pop out and manifest. <laughs> Oh, you know, they're, they're an encourager and they're, they're going to start encouraging somebody. Are they, are they going to teach somebody? Are they going to comfort somebody? Are they going to, they're going to serve somebody in some way? Glory to God. Amen. Hallelujah. And say, are, are they going to just right there on the spot begin to pray for somebody? Glory to God. All these things begin to, to manifest and, and, are, and, are, and are brought out. Hallelujah. Amen. I, I look at Kay right there. I mean, she, she's floating around here. This, sometimes... She does this consciously and she does it unconsciously. Sometimes she's on purpose seeking somebody out that she knows might need help or might need prayer or might need. You know, she's always done that for the youth as long as she's been here. Yes. She'll go and make sure, are, are you going to camp? If you don't have money to go to camp, I need to know about it. My, you know, me and Gary will help you. Yes. And she's checking on somebody that hadn't been around in a while. And, and can I pray? You know, she's just doing that all the time. Isn't that wonderful? I'm, and I, I just, she's the first one I saw. Like, it's probably true of most of you, you know. I know it is. 
The word fellowship in the Greek is kononia, K-O-I-N-O-N-I-A, kononia. And it means, now listen to this, because it means all of these things. It means Christian fellowship, communion, association, and joint participation with fellow believers. So let's look at 2 Corinthians chapter 6. 2 Corinthians chapter 6. This scripture is brought out in a lot of ways sometimes, but it's a good, powerful scripture. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse number 14. It says, do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. Now, why is God telling you this? Because he's trying to make your life miserable? No, because he knows there's a principle that you cannot associate with the wrong kinds of things and not be tremendously influenced by it. So he says, do not be unequally yoked. See, if you're yoked, that means you're having close fellowship and communion. You, we, we minister to the world. We, we rub shoulders with the world. You minister to co-workers and so forth. We're talking about communion. We're talking about, uh, you know, close, intimate fellowship. Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness? None. What communion has light with darkness? None. What, what, what accord, you know, one accord, has Christ with Belial? Or what part has a believer with an unbeliever? And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk among them. I will be their God and they shall be my people. Therefore, come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Amen. Glory to God. So we need to fellowship with other believers when we come to church for many, many, and that happens when we come to church for many reasons. One main reason is because of the power of associations. We are, we are, all of us, greatly influenced by the people and places and things we closely associate with, those we commune with, those we are linked to and have joint participation with. This is a spiritual law. I don't care who you are or who you think you are, you cannot violate this law. It's like the law of gravity. The law of gravity, you know, is, is, is holding your feet to the ground. If you jump off a building, you're going you're gonna, to, you know, if you jump off a 10-story building, you're going to go down. And so you wouldn't dare say, well, that doesn't apply to me. I don't believe that really works every time. You would never do that, would you? Well, you can never take this law and say, well, you know, no, I can buddy-buddy, and, and I don't have to have fellowship with other believers, and, and it won't affect me. You're deceived. You just jumped off the 10-story building. Amen. And, and it's, this is a much, much bigger deal than the average Christian knows about or pays any attention to. But the Bible, the B-I-B-L-E, is full of scriptures along these lines uh, that tell us that, 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 that this principle and this truth, uh, if listened to, if listened to, if we listen to this truth and principle, it will protect us and help us. If we don't, we will be unprotected. For instance, Paul said in 1 Corinthians 5, 9, Paul said, I wrote to you not to keep company. He's talking to believers. I wrote to you not to keep company with sexually immoral people. Now, we're just not picking on sexually immoral people. If you go down and read verse number 11, he says, are revilers. Revilers are those who use their tongue to criticize and slander and talk bad about other people all the time. And he's talking about, he's not talking about people in the world. He's talking about a brother or sister in church. If they're going to, if they're going to be involved with, is they're going to be sexually immoral, you know, not repent. They just live in it, practice it. He says, don't associate with them. If they're going to continually talk bad about people and slander people and use their tongues to hurt other people, he said, don't fellowship with them. Hmm. How about that? The Amplified Bible says not to associate closely and habitually with unchaste, impure people. See, this principle applies to all areas, as we'll see. Fellowshipping with the ungodly, fellowshipping with those who know nothing about faith, nothing about love, nothing about the power of God, they don't believe in the promises of God, they don't believe in the Holy Spirit, will drag you down. Amen. I said it will drag you down. You can't go there week after week after week and listen to doubt and fear and unbelief and people that ignore the promises of God or deny the promises of God and it not influence you and affect you. Proverbs 12, 26 says, The righteous should choose his friends carefully, for the way of the wicked will lead him astray. 
Proverbs 13, 20 says, He who walks with, if you're walking with somebody, you're keeping close company. He who walks with a wise man will be wise. But the companion, communion, fellowship, the companion of fools will be destroyed. I'm just trying to show you how this principle applies in every area of our lives. Amen. Psalms 1, and, I, and again, I'm just skimming over this because we could teach easy several messages on this. But in Psalm 1, uh, just to get a general overview here, it says, blessed. How many of you want to be blessed? Amen. Blessed is the man, blessed is the woman who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, who nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. That means you don't join in with them. You're not fellowshipping with them. You're not joining in with them and their, their, their wrong-headedness and their wrong thinking. He said, but you're blessed if you don't do that. A footnote, com a footnote commentary in the Spirit-Filled Life Bible of Psalms 1-1 there says, the friends one chooses determines to a large extent one's destiny and success in life. That's what the Bible teaches. That's the power of associations. If you don't believe that, It doesn't matter. <laughs> you will sooner or later find out that, that, that people are drag, building you up or they're dragging you down. He said, Godly counsel is a prerequisite for prosperity in the broadest sense. In other words, if you want to have prosperity in your marriage or prosperity in your finances or prosperity in your health or prosperity in your mind, or, then you've got to obey this scripture. God told the Israelites not to associate and in, intermingle and marry with, with those ungodly nations, those heathen nations. That's because God was a racist. Are you kidding me? It had absolutely nothing to do with racism. It had nothing to do with, 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 what's the word they use about not liking other countries? I don't know. Anyway, it had nothing to do with that. It had to do with they're heathens. They don't know me. They serve false God. They live wicked, ungodly lives. They don't obey my commandments. And you cannot get around those people and associate with those people and even marry those people without it dragging you down. That's my paraphrase. But, and you know, if you've read the Old Testament, that time and time and time again, they didn't obey God. They didn't do what God said. And because they did intermingle with those people and closely associate themselves with those people, that it cost them greatly and it was with all kinds of disastrous results. I think of King Solomon. You can follow me here if you like. I'll read it to you. 1 Kings 11. 1 Kings 11. We come to church and we're fellowshipping and we're associating with like-minded people of like faith. Glory to God. It says in 1 Kings 11, 1, But King Solomon loved many foreign women, as well as the daughters of Pharaoh, women of the Moabites, Ammonites, Edomites, Sidonians, and Hittites. These are those people that God said, Do not! In some cases, he even said, Totally wipe them out and destroy them. God said, Do not fellowship with them. Do not commune with them. From the nation, well, it says in verse 2, From the nations of whom the Lord had said to the children of Israel, You shall not intermarry with them, nor shall they with you. Surely they will turn away your hearts after their gods. Solomon clung to these in love. And he had 700 wives, princesses, and 300 concubines, and his wives, listen to this, his wives turned away his heart. The wisest man that ever lived thought he could violate this principle and it not bother him. And he was wrong. Verse 4 says, For it was so when Solomon was old that his wife turned his heart after other gods, and his heart was not loyal to the Lord his God, as was the heart of his father David. Amen. 1 Corinthians 15, 33. Do not be deceived. Evil company corrupts good habits. And of course, everybody says you have to hang around wicked, ugly people, then they're going to influence you to be wicked, ugly. And that's true. But you know, in context, in context, Paul is talking about people that are saying that Jesus has not been raised from the dead. And he's saying, if you listen to that doctrine, don't be deceived. Evil company will corrupt your, your doctrine. It'll corrupt what you think. So you cannot keep company and run with wrong people and not be adversely influenced. They will corrupt your character. They will corrupt your doctrine. They will corrupt your beliefs. Amen? I said amen? See, what fellowship has light with darkness? 
and it's not. But when you come to church, you're, you're, you're being influenced and you're hanging around it and you're having like-minded fellowship. You're bringing yourself for that fellowship. There's communion and there's godly and association, which is of great benefit to those uh, that you minister to and to you. And you mingling, and, and as you're mingling and closely associating with others during these times, just, just all kind of wonderful things just break out. <laughs> Prayer and encouragement and comfort and love and meeting of one another's needs and carrying one another's burdens. It's a wonderful thing. It's really a wonderful thing. Can you say amen? Amen. amen. Glory to God. Hallelujah. So it's extremely important that we have regular fellowship with other like-minded believers. Glory to God. And then we've got to move kind of faster. Matthew chapter 18. Matthew chapter 18. What else do we bring? Matthew 18, 19 and 20. Again, I say to you that if two of you agree on earth concerning anything that they asked, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. If just two of you agree. Amen. What should we bring to church? We should bring our faith. See, the prayer of agreement is two or more people using their mutual faith to receive something from God, to ask God to do something. P.C. Nelson, a, you know, was a Greek scholar, said this verse in the Greek literally reads, if two of you, just two of you agree and ask anything in my name and I don't have it, I will make it for you. Glory to God. Paul said in Romans 1.12, we are mutually encouraged and comforted by one another's faith. If two of you in faith agree, it will be done. And so many times when I'm here on Sundays, sometimes during the service, sometimes during the altar call, sometimes before the service, sometimes during the week, a lot of my prayers for people is just the prayer of faith. I'm agreeing. They're telling me about some situation and I'm agree we're agreeing together. That is taken care. We're agreeing together. They are the healed. We're agreeing together. That need is met. We're agreeing together. That, that prayer request is met. We're agreeing. And Jesus said, you know, when, when two of you agree, when you really agree, well, you have to be in, you have to believe the word to agree. When two of you really believe the word, when two of you agree in faith, then it will be done. It will be. This, this is just another tool, but a powerful tool, another method available for us in order to release our faith. You don't have to agree with somebody else. You can release your faith a lot of ways. But this is another available opportunity to help us release our faith. Can you say amen? amen. And Jesus guaranteed it would bring results. But beyond that, beyond that, beyond that, the prayer of agreement, any two of us or all of us praying and agreeing together is powerful and helpful on another level. You know, Brother Hagin said, we may be mighty in prayer alone, but we can be mightier with someone joining us. One can chase a thousand, but two can put 10,000 to flight. There's just something about the prayer of agreement where it, we, we feed off one another. We, 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 we stimulate each other's faith. Maybe you're agreeing with somebody that's having a little bit, little bit of trouble there and, and you know, they want to waver, they want, but they see your faith and it, and it emboldens them and, and bolsters them and you give them a testimony about what God did for you and, and then they're, they're like, yes, 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 let's agree together. So there's just something about it that, that sparks us and causes us to be able to release or activate our faith. And then just by the de very definition, it says if two of you agree on earth, you know, in the Greek that means to harmonize, to be in one accord. And it's often used because it really relates to that in, 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 in the Bible, the way the Greeks use it. It has to do with like an orchestra. You ever seen an orchestra? You ever, you ever go to Lee University and see Dr. Holsinger, Miss Holsinger, and they're about to have a, put on a concert? With all the musicians are out there going, ring, 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 and it's just, a, just mass confusion. Then he steps up on the podium and they all... And then you start, and then it's a, it's a symphony. That's what he's talking about. You, 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 it's a symphony of accord and agreement. And to really be in accord, to really have one agreement, j just by the very definition of this, to pray the prayer of agreement, you have to have love for one another. You have to care about one another to agree with them. You, you have to be interested in them. There has to be a oneness of heart involved here. It involves unity and faith. It involves corporate unity and faith when it's the whole body of Christ. And, and I don't know how to fully explain it, but there's just a lot of powerful principles at work here. So all this working together makes for a powerful prayer, the prayer of agreement. 
And Jesus said, when you pray in agreement, I'm right there in your midst to make it happen. Amen. We bring our faith when we come to church. And I tell you, it's, it's, it's so important because um, huh, sometimes it takes the corporate faith of a body of believers, of a local church to get the job done. I mean, I, Pastor John could know for an absolute fact that it's the perfect will of God to buy this $4 million property down the road. But if I'm kind of like, oh, well, and I don't agree with him, and some of you agree with him, and some of you don't, you know what? We ain't getting that $4 million property, even if it's God's perfect will. Now, if Pastor John believes by his stripes I'm healed, it don't matter what you think. He can get that directly from God. But some things aren't just me or the board or, or, or the elders. It's, it's the whole corporate body. All of us collectively have to be in agreement. Remember Joshua and Caleb? How many of you know they wandered in the desert for 40 years, just like the rest of the Israelites? They had great faith. They said, we're well able to possess the land. Let's go up at once and take the land. They believed. But the unbelief of the entire group, called, see, they're a part of a group, and the group unbelief caused them to have to wander in the desert for 40 years with everybody else. Now, because of their faith, 40 years later, they did get into the promised land, but they, they you know, in other words, they just couldn't say, well, I don't care what y'all believe. I believe I'm going over there. No, they, had, they were part of a group. So, so the group faith, the corporate faith, everybody agreeing together is a very powerful thing. Can you say amen? amen. So we bring our faith and it helps uh, individual members of the body and the collective body. And then, and then, what time, oh my, uh, then what else do we bring? Malachi, Malachi, chapter 3, verse number 10. You know, Malachi teaches about tithes and offerings. And verse number 10 says, bring, when we come to church, we bring our tithes and offerings. Because he's been talking about tithes and offerings. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse. The storehouse is the local church. That there may be food in my house, meat in my house. Glory to God, amen. When you bring and give your tithes and offerings, you get blessed personally. You know that. God says, try me in this. I will open up the windows of heaven for you and pour out for you such a blessing. There will not be room enough to receive it all. But when you bring your tithes, Amen. It blesses the local church. It, it gives money to the storehouse. So the local church has the, the money it needs to operate. Amen. And to do what God has called it to do and to pay people and to turn on the lights and build buildings and bless people and help people and teach and preach the word of God and minister to children and all the other things the local church does. Can you say amen? amen? So these are all things we give and bring to church. One man said, God assigns people to a particular church. That's where your supply works best. And that's where your supply is most needed. Unfortunately, people don't follow the Lord and they make decisions solely based on what they think is best for them or what advances their cause or their particular ministry. But you ought to go to a church because God led you there and you shouldn't leave because you got offended. You shouldn't leave because you think there's a, the grass is greener on the other side or, you, you, you know, or because you think that you, you have a better opportunity to do something there. Amen. So, so, all of our decisions, not where we go to church, but not just where we go to church, but all of our decisions in life, amen, first and foremost, glory to God, we, before we do anything else, we ought to consider God's plan and purpose for our lives. That should be first in our thinking. Glory to God. Amen? Amen. amen. And then some people just don't show up. And like I said, if you're, if you're my hand didn't show up tonight, I'd be up here with one hand, you know. And if one eye didn't show up, I'd be up here like here and, you know, I could go on, but I won't. <laughs> Let's turn this around real quick, real quick. Uh, here's the other side of the coin. What do you get in return? What do you get when you go to church? Well, first of all, you receive the benefit of what all these other people are bringing. You receive the benefit of their prayers, of their fellowship, of their faith, amen, of their giving. If they're using their particular talent and gift and anointing, glory to God, hallelujah, amen. And all of that, their prayers, their faith, their gifts, their fellowship with you, their offerings, their love, bless you in 101 different ways. Can you say amen? amen. And then the anointed word is ministered to you and your entire family. 
uh, from the pastors that God connects you to. James 1.21 says the word saves and renews and heals your mind, your will and your emotions. It says your soul, but your soul there is not talking about your spirit. It's talking about your mind, your will and emotions. That's what the word will do for you. When you hear the word preached, 1 Timothy 3.16 says the word, amen, is profitable for you, for doctrine, for correction, for reproof, for instruction, amen. All of, the, all of that causes you to grow up spiritually. Glory to God, hallelujah. Desire the sincere milk of, milk of the word that you may grow thereby. In Titus it says you receive the truth so that you won't be deceived and you won't be misled. You don't want to be deceived and misled. There's a lot of things out there to deceive people these days. You don't want to be deceived. You don't want to be misled. Isn't that right? Amen. You should know the truth and the truth will make you free. When, the, when you hear the word of God, it helps you get in faith. Amen. And when you get in faith, you live victoriously. Glory to God. Many, many scriptures tell us uh, that, that we receive love. Amen. You get hands-on love from other members of the body of Christ. Everybody needs love. Everybody needs love. Everybody wants to be loved. What the world needs now <laughs> is love, sweet. Everybody needs love. Everybody wants love. Glory to God. You get that if you're going to a godly church. You experience anointings of the Spirit that are only in manifestation to a corporate group of believers. The Holy Ghost says things many times to the whole body. He's not just talking to one person. He's talking to the whole body. You don't get that by yourself. The Holy Ghost manifests. There's demonstrations of the Spirit, workings of the Spirit, movings of the Spirit that only happen in a corporate setting. They don't happen to you ever. Certain manifestations of the Spirit privately. They only happen to gatherings, to groups. Glory to God. Amen. And, but everybody needs those corporate manifestations of the Spirit. Romans 1.11 says, You receive impartations from spiritual gifts that establish and strengthen you. James 5.14 says, You get healed at church. You hear prophecies from the Lord. Amen. Again, that apply to the whole body, not just one member. And so much more, so much more. Glory to God. Amen. Hallelujah. And you see that the thing about it is that, uh, the reason that we have people out there that backslide, many of those reasons are because they're not here getting these things. If they were here getting these things, they wouldn't have backslid. And a lot of people in the body of Christ that, that are weak is because they're not here getting those things. And a lot of people in the body of Christ that are immature, they're immature because they're not here getting those things on a regular basis. Now, do we love them? Of course we love them. It doesn't have anything to do with love. Glory to God. But if they would hear, it would, it, would, it would, I can't imagine. I mean, I'm a pastor. I spend a lot of time in the Word. I spend time in prayer. I just can't imagine not coming to church. And, and, and I, you know, just, just Brittany getting up and testifying Sunday. Oh, my goodness. You, you know, I, I remember a man whose, whose daughter, now this, this daughter now is, is in her 50s, maybe close to 60, but, but she had a lot of physical problems when she was just a young teenager. You know, we were at the other building, uh, and she, she had all kind of things, and it didn't look good. It looked like it was possibly, you know, terminal. And I remember he came to church, and, and somebody sang a special. And, 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 you know, this man was a strong Oral Roberts, you know, fan. He, he loved Oral Roberts. You know, it was back in the day, Oral Roberts, and really followed Oral Roberts, and he, he was a strong Kenneth Copeland man. But somebody sang that song, about Jesus walking on the water and how he reached out his hand to pick up Peter even though he failed and, and it, just, it, just, it just flooded all over him and just broke all over him and all his burden and care was removed and, and he was energized and comforted and helped and blessed because and, he was under a lot of, you know, you're under pressure when you think your 18-year-old daughter is going to die. But he was there to hear it. Just, just you know, Person up singing under the anointing of the Spirit of God. Glory to God. Glory to God. So, the church is God's idea. Can you say amen? amen? I mean, we didn't use the scripture that everybody always uses, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together. But who said that? God. Forsake not the assembling of yourselves together. And so much more. Do you believe you're living in the last of the last days? And so much more as you see the time approaching. Amen. I mean, God said that. You know, we live in a day and age with, with a lot of our young people, especially that, you know, Jesus maybe, but the church, 
Oh, stinky, ugly church, pathetic church. Jesus loves the church. Amen. Jesus died for the church. Yes. Jesus is the head of the church. Yes. Jesus established the church. And he doesn't view the church that way. And then, of course, the word clearly teaches that people need to hear the word preached. Amen. And church people utilize their spiritual gifts. A church is a place where we connect. Just kind of review and say it in a different way. A church is a place where we connect with other believers. You know, there's almost 60 one another scriptures in the Bible. Care for one another, love one another, pray for one another. Almost 60 of the, how many of you know what I, what I mean when I say the one another scriptures? I mean, there's whole books have been written about the one and other scriptures. Almost 60 in the New Testament. Glory to God. Three of the letters to the church, three of the letters specifically to Christians, you know, you have the four Gospels, but then, but then you have the letters that are specifically written to us under the day of grace. Our pastoral epistles, three. God spent three of them talking to pastors because Jesus said, I gave gifts unto men and pastors are one of those gifts. What are the pastors doing? Ministered in the church. Well, I don't need a pastor. I don't need a church. That's ridiculous. Amen. And then look at this. We'll close with this. We'll close with this. Revelation chapter 1. I said Jesus loves the church. Jesus cares about the church. Jesus is interested in the church. Jesus is involved in the church. If, if Jesus is directing the church. And, and uh, I left out one. I should say that the church is where the most, uh, is where effective outreach and evangelism and missions takes place. It takes place through the ministries of the church, the church, the church, the church. Amen. I know people do other things and that's great and wonderful and we're all for it, but the church is where, effect, is where the great commission is carried out. Outreach, evangelism, missions. But in Revelation chapter 1, The mystery of the seven stars, which is on my right hand, now he tells you, because he talks about stars and lamps, and so he tells you. The mystery of the seven stars, which you saw on my right hand, and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. Almost everybody believes that's the local pastor, the pastor of the church. And the seven lampstands, which, lamp which you saw, are the seven churches. Going to write those, you know, deal with those seven churches. The seven lampstands are the seven churches. Who said that? So what are the seven lampstands? The seven lampstands are the seven churches. What are the seven lampstands? Amen. To the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things says he who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. He walks in the midst of the seven churches. Jesus is going to talk to these seven churches about some very specific things that are going on in those local churches. He calls people by name. He says, you're doing this in this particular church that's right. You're doing this in the particular church that's wrong. He is very aware and actively involved in these seven local churches. And it says he's even walking in the midst. When we gather together, the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God, our Lord and Savior walks right in the midst of us. Amen. And so you have to ask yourself, well, what, what is he seeing? Glory to God. Amen. But, but he cares about the local church. He's involved in the local church. The local church is his idea. So we should be involved with the local church with the right motives for all the right reasons because Jesus loves the church and told us what his purposes were and told us what our part should be in the local church. Can you say amen? amen? I was preaching one time and a lady told me, she said, I saw into the spirit. And she said, she said just, Jesus was just right there. If you walked over here, he was just right behind you. If you walked over this way, he was just right there. He was just right behind you. He was just, he was just, I heard another man say he had a vision. He said, I saw Jesus walking up and down the aisles and, and he'd stop and he'd, he'd look at somebody worshiping and and he, and he was paying attention to, to everything that was every detail that was going on in the local church. That's a, on a lot of levels, 
<laughs> a tremendous thought, isn't it? Can you say amen? amen? Let's stand together. I'm so glad I am associated with you. I really am. Every one of you are su such a tremendous blessing. Every one of you has blesses me. I, I'm so glad I come to church. There's been times, I told somebody the other day, I said, especially when I was younger, I said, there were times I didn't want to go to church, but you know, I was the pastor. <laughs> I think back then it's because I just didn't feel worthy and I felt guilty and unrighteous all the time, you know, and so it wasn't because I didn't want to go, but now I don't think that way. So I, I mean, I can't wait. I can't wait to give to the church. I can't wait to come. I can't wait to see people. I can't wait to do a message. I can't wait to hear a message. Glory to God. And I really do, I think, my goodness, I, I, don't, I don't know where. I mean, it's God. Yes, it's God in my relationship with Jesus, but because, I'm, because I love God and because I have a relationship with Jesus, I'm hooked up with His church. And without that, I just don't know where Margaret and I would have ended or, or where our girls would have ended. Or I just, I'm so grateful, aren't you? Yes. Amen, amen, amen. God bless you, God bless you, God bless you. We love you so much. Thanks for coming on Wednesday night. You're dismissed. Thank you, Jesus. Amen, amen.